We continue to travel with Jesus along the path, along the way that leads there, that leads to the life that God is calling us to as disciples, as those who desire to follow after Him, to serve Him, to know Him, to love Him, and to reflect His glory in the earth for His glory and for His praise, but also for the benefit of all of humanity, people who are walking in darkness, who need light. And there's a way that leads there. And so we've been following Jesus through these travel narratives in Luke chapter 9 through 19. And uh, today we find ourselves in Luke chapter 16 as Jesus is telling yet another parable, another story to illuminate our hearts and minds as to what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 16 as we give our attention to verses 19 through 31 and as we hear the story or the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles or take a pew Bible and we'll stand for the reading of God's Word. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, And Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers. So that, he, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we desire to hear your word, Moses and the prophets, to hear the word of your Son, who is the great high priest, and who is the prophet in the line of Moses, the one that you raised up to be a great deliverer for your people. And he is our king. He is the one that leads the way. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to follow. Help us to receive the good gifts that you have for us today, not only with the deacons that have been installed and ordained and set aside, but to receive the good gifts of your word, the preaching of your word, the truth and the grace that you would have for us. Bless us by it and transform us in order that we might go out from this place to show forth the goodness of God. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. We are in a sermon series, as I've shared with you, that is entitled The Travel Stories of Jesus. Jesus is teaching along the way, along the path that he is going as he resolutely sets his face toward Jerusalem, having left Capernaum, having left the region of Galilee in the north, he heads south, but he makes his way up 
in elevation as he is going to Jerusalem. And as I was thinking about the path that uh, God has us on, as he has called us to follow after him, I was reminded of this path, which actually may be a path that's very familiar to many of you. This is the Gilfillan Trail that is right here in the South Hills, right here in Upper St. Clair, just off of Route 19. The Gilfillan Trail goes around Gilfillan Farm, and uh, Gilfillan Farm and Gilfillan Trail, right off of 19, right next to Westminster Presbyterian Church. If you've ever made your way to Upper St. Clair High School, if you've ever made your way south to Washington County or to McMurray, you have passed the Gilfillan Trail. Holly and I used to make much use out of the Gilfillan Trail, particularly when our kids were smaller and we were living in Bethel Park. When we lived in Bethel Park, we had a three-bedroom um, Cape Cod that started to feel a bit close by February. And so as soon as the warmer weather would start to break, we would look for ways to get out of the house and to let the kids run off some of that energy and youthful enthusiasm and excitement that they would have building up in them week after week over the winter. And it was also a tremendous time to go and to see the natural beauty that can be found at Gilfillan Trail and Gilfillan Farm as the daffodils would come up uh, in the spring, the tulips. It's really quite beautiful and gorgeous. But every once in a while, as we were walking along the trail, Holly and I would notice something. We actually, on more than one occasion, which kind of surprised me, but we would find a snake that would make its way across the trail. They were always small little gardener snakes, but they were coming out of the grasses in order to get into the sun, to bathe in the sun, and oftentimes they looked like sticks, and we would uh, keep an eye out for them because there were a few occasions in which we got very close to one, and we wanted the children to avoid the snakes. It's a good lesson to learn in life. That's just a, a good life lesson. But we didn't want to alarm them that there was a snake on the trail. And so Holly and I developed code language. And we would be walking along the trail and Holly and I would talk about how we would keep our eye out for the hobbits. The hobbits might be on the trail this morning or this afternoon and we would say, have you seen any hobbits or walk away from the hobbit over there? But I'll never forget the time that we missed the hobbit. And Holly was walking along, you remember this? And she happened to step on what looked like a snake, or excuse me, a stick, but it was a snake and it started to move and Holly recognized it or realized it only after the fact, and then the snake started to move. And there was what you might call quite a commotion that happened after that. We missed the snake. We failed to recognize the hobbit. Now, I tell you that story in order to illustrate a point, which is really the central point of the text that I want us to focus on this morning. You see, sometimes we don't see things until it's too late. We were walking along the trail, and fortunately it was just a gardener snake, and we failed to recognize it, and Holly stepped on it, and it created quite a commotion. But sometimes we don't see things until it's too late, and they're things of great consequence. As Jesus is telling the story of the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man failed to see Lazarus until it was too late. We've all had this experience. We've all been in this place where we have failed to recognize something before it's too late. Sometimes it never comes to our attention and we don't even know what has happened. Sometimes we find out after the fact and it's lamentable, it's regrettable. Sometimes we find out after the fact and it's, there are still things that we can do to repair or to mend 
But oftentimes, many times, we don't see things until it's too late. This is the burden of lost opportunity. And those who are in leadership positions know this burden and this dilemma all too well. If you lead an organization, if you lead a business, you are looking for and trying to sense opportunity, to sense opportunities to guide your business or to guide your family. And you don't want to wait or you don't want to miss it when it's too late, when your children are little and you have the opportunity to invest in them, to train them up in the way that they should go so that when they are older, they will not depart from it. Sometimes we don't see it, though, until it's too late. We also know the gracious and redemptive power of truthful foresight. It's been difficult to... No, it's been difficult to hear the truth that Holly was born with a congenital heart defect that is resulting in this syndrome called Wolf-Parkinson-White. All things being equal, I wish I hadn't known. I, I wish it wasn't an issue, but it is an issue. And even though it's difficult to know, I'm glad that we know before it's too late to have been caught off guard by it, to have no opportunity to respond to it, to deal with it. It is the blessing and the grace of redemptive, truthful foresight. While we are on the way, while we are on the path that God has called us to, Jesus brings difficult truth to our attention and to the attention of those who are around him so that we might see something before it is too late. Sometimes we don't see things until it's too late. That was the case of the rich man. He was a rich man who enjoyed fine clothing and had a sumptuous table and every day as he stepped out of his house as he crossed through his gate there was a man lying on the ground who longed to eat just the scraps just the crumbs that would fall from his table his life was falling apart for all to see and if his life wasn't enough to draw attention, dogs would surround him, making a commotion and a fuss, licking his wounds. But the rich man didn't see it until it was too late. There are lots of theological categories and applications of this text. It provides essential data for understanding Jesus' teaching on what is traditionally known as the four last things. If you want to gain insight about what Jesus has to say about death, you go to this text. If you want insight about what Jesus has to teach about judgment, you go to this text. If you want insight about what Jesus has to say about heaven or about hell, you go to this text. There's much to be gained about the four last things and our understanding of them here in Luke chapter 16. This is a great place to go to consider the stewardship responsibility that is laid upon us as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a great text to go to to consider poverty and wealth and charity and the responsibility that is laid upon the church. But this morning, I want to set all of that aside and I want us to drill down on one issue alone. And that is vision. That is sight. And not missing it before... It is too late. Our focus is that the rich man didn't see Lazarus until it was too late. Why? 
Why did he fail to see him? He certainly saw him enough to be able to recognize him when he was in the torment of hell. To say, there's Lazarus. Abraham, would you call him and send him and have him bring me relief? I know that face. I know that man, even in glory. But he didn't see him the way that he needed to see them. He didn't see Lazarus in the fullness of all that was being represented. The rich man failed to see Lazarus because he failed to see the fullness of grace and truth. He saw him as a man who was dying at his gate. He failed to see Lazarus as a revelation of the fullness of grace and truth. The rich man could see a measure of grace. He knew a little bit about grace. He knew a little bit about unmerited favor. He was, after all, a very rich man. And he recognized that God had blessed him, at least in part. He had to have some recognition that God was involved within the enterprise and the economy of his life. And that unlike others, he had been blessed with riches. And he understood grace at least a little bit in the material, but not in the spiritual. He understood a little bit of truth, a measure of it. He recognized himself. As a child of Abraham, he recognized himself as a member of the covenant community, so much so that when he enters into hell and he sees Abraham, he calls out and says, Father Abraham, I know you. I'm connected with you. He doesn't see the fullness of grace and truth. He doesn't see them fully or how they come together. You see, the rich man was a man who would not or could not see Jesus. The rich man becomes an example for all those who would not or could not see Jesus. Jesus is the fullness of Grace and truth, as the Apostle John shares with us in the prologue of his gospel, he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us, spent time among us, revealed himself to us. And we have seen his glory, the irradiation of the glory of God in his life, glory of the only Son from the Father, what? full of grace and truth. Grace means favor. Unmerited favor. God's goodwill, not just so that we might be rich, but God's goodwill for us, for the flourishing of all that he has made. God is committed to the full flourishing and formation and glory of all that he has made. And because he is committed to that, that is grace, his engagement. He is committed to justification and to our sanctification. Grace is God coming to us, taking us out of our miserable estate, and him saying, I love you, I'm committed to you, I'm going to bring you along to a place where you can thrive, where you can grow, where you can be the fullness of all that I have made you to be. That is the fullness of grace. And Jesus represents and reveals the fullness of truth. Truth is a statement. Truth is a witness to the way things really are. I am God. You are not God, Jesus says. That's the truth. And because I'm God and you are not God, I'm going to take you out of your miserable estate, out of grace, and I'm going to lead you into the fullness of what I have for you. The revelation and the glory of God fullness of grace and truth. Grace, however, 
comes to be understood in various and many ways. We've defined grace in the church. We've defined grace in our culture in ways that seem to appeal to us most. Many times, grace can be devoid of truth. And what we talk about when we talk about grace is really license. Would you please just excuse my bad behavior? Would you please affirm the direction that I want to go? You're telling me I can't do this? Well, that's not very nice. Why don't you extend some grace? Grace without any truth becomes license. Likewise, truth without any grace becomes accusation, an indictment. The tactic, actually, of the evil one, who is the accuser of the brethren. And as he accuses the brethren, he's not speaking falsely. He's saying, you're dead. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. You have failed to keep the law of God. You deserve punishment. Send them away. All of that is true. And devoid of grace. But Jesus has come to show a revelation the fullness of grace and truth, and to show how they work together. You see, when grace and truth come together, they produce something called authority. The fullness of grace and the fullness of truth in the Lord Jesus Christ is a revelation of the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Authority knows the way things really are. Authority sets the boundaries. Authority sets the path. It knows how to get there. And authority has the power, has the favor, has the goodwill to see one's life come into conformity with the truth, with the purposes that God has for us. Fullness of grace and fullness of truth in the Lord Jesus Christ is authority. And Jesus knows that. Jesus has authority. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and be what I have called you to be. His word and his teaching has authority. So much so, the fullness of grace and the fullness of truth that when the people heard his teaching, they said, he doesn't teach like these other people. He doesn't teach like the Pharisees. He doesn't teach like the scribes. He doesn't teach like the lawyers. What is the distinguishing feature or characteristic that distinguishes Jesus' teaching? He has authority, the people say. Fullness, grace, and truth brought together in one man, in one life, in one revelation. Jesus has authority, his word has authority, and his scriptures have authority. You have Moses and the prophets, Abraham said. You had grace and truth together there in the word of God. He failed. The rich man ignored that authority. A great peril. You see, the reason for the rich man's damnation and his eternity in hell was not his lack of generosity toward Lazarus. The reason he found himself in hell, much to his own surprise, even though he recognized a measure of grace and a measure of truth, he found himself in hell because of his disregard for God's authority. Disregard for grace and truth, a disregard for Moses and the prophets, he did not believe in the authority of Scripture. And he certainly did not think his disregard for Scripture would lead him to hell. He thought he had enough. He thought he knew who Abraham was, enough to be able to identify him in eternity. How much more for those, Jesus is teaching, how much more peril for those who disregard the fullness 
of grace and truth. The fullness of the authority of God as it has been revealed in the Son as He has come to tabernacle and dwell among us. Those who think they know enough to be able to call out in eternity and see Jesus and call Him Lord. Lord! We prophesied in Your name. Lord! We conducted miracles in Your name. Lord! We did all these things in Your name. And Jesus says, to their surprise, be removed. Depart from Me. I don't know You. You never came under my authority. You never came under the fullness of grace and truth. To come under authority is to come under the fullness of grace and truth. To be authorized is to be conformed to God's plan. To be authorized is to be conformed to God's purposes and will. To be authorized is to yield oneself to the authority of God and say, not my will, but your will be done. Not only for my life, but for the entirety of all that you have made. I want to see my life and the entire created order, the cosmos, Brought under your authority, the right ordering of all things and my place in it. To come under authority is to come under the fullness of grace and truth. So this leads us to a question. How many of us have been authorized? Has our life been authorized? Can I see it? Do I recognize it before it's too late? And so I want to ask a few diagnostic questions with you so that we might know before it is too late. Has my life come into conformity? Conformity with the grace and truth of God in His Word. Are the Scriptures the final rule of faith and practice for my life. How do I see the scriptures? When I come to the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, is that a nice story? Yes, it is a story. It is a parable. It's something that Jesus is teaching. But does it have import in my life? Does it assert authority over my life? Does it challenge me to change my life? Does my life come into conformity with the grace of and truth of God's word. Are the scriptures the final rule of faith and practice not only for my life, but for the kingdom of God, for the church, for the entire created order? And have I come under the authority, the fullness of grace, grace and truth, and not only the word of God, but the word made flesh? Seeking to see Jesus before it is too late. Has my life come into conformity with the finite nature of my existence? Our lives may be eternal, as this parable suggests, but our lives are not infinite. They are finite. God is infinite, and we are not. And one day, this life of ours will come to an end. Do I recognize that? Do I have what the philosophers and theologians suggest is a balanced conscience between earth and heaven? Has my life come into conformity with the purpose of my life? Not just the purpose that I desire to uh, prescribe for it, but the purpose that God has for my life. Have I considered the question, what is the chief end of all of humanity? That great question that is posed for us in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is man's chief end? Why am I here? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Is my life come into conformity with that? Is my life authorized by that answer? Has my life come into conformity with the eternal consequences of my actions? 
Do I live in such a way that counts for eternity, recognizes the priority of eternal rewards and consequences? Am I storing up treasures for heaven? Or am I living in a way different than that? Is my life coming to conformity with the equity of God's kingdom? There's lots of talk right now in our public discourse about equity and equality. Equal opportunities, equal outcomes, equity between people. A lot of conversation, but there's also a conversation about the equity of the kingdom. God is not necessarily an equal opportunity employer. He is God and we are not. And that distinction is not to be confused. And he is ordained that those who have not lived a life under the authority of his son will live in a particular way in eternity. That is the equity of the kingdom of God. And for those who decide to follow Jesus, those who come under the fullness of grace and truth will have a particular outcome in eternity. Has my life come into conformity with this? Has my life come into conformity with the necessity of diligent obedience? That the authority of God requires, it demands close consideration day by day to evaluate my life and to ask, am I following him? Am I seeking to please him? Am I living in such a way that honors and glorifies him? We must ask these questions before it's too late. Sometimes we don't see it until it's too late. In 1998, philosopher and theologian Dallas Willard wrote a book entitled The Divine Conspiracy. It was a celebrated book. There was a 20th anniversary edition that came out in 2018. And in the book, Willard wrote that the mission statement of every church, every church, should read as follows. Why does the church exist? Willard says this. We teach all who seriously commit themselves to Jesus how to do everything he said to do. What is Willard saying? The church exists to bring all men, all women, and all children under the authority of Christ Jesus. To come under and to receive the fullness of grace and truth. And that's why here at Beverly Heights, we echo this mission when we say that we exist to be a living witness to the glory of God, a witness to Jesus, to the authority, the one who's full of grace and truth. And it is through Jesus Christ by which all men, women, and children will find the fullness of life in him, will be authorized by him, will be saved by him, will have their lives conformed in accord with him. We teach all who seriously commit themselves to Jesus how to do everything he said to do, to see it before it is too late. Willard went on in a different uh, thing that he wrote, an article that he wrote entitled Spiritual Formation in Christ, a perspective on what it is and how it might be done. And there in this uh, article, he makes a remarkable claim. He says, quote, I know of no current denomination or local congregation that has a concrete plan and a practice for teaching people to do, quote, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. He said, I don't know of a church, I don't know of a denomination that has a concrete plan in order to bring people to commit themselves seriously to Jesus, to learn how to come under his authority. And when I read that quote in 2011, I said, challenge accepted. 
We are going to become a local congregation that has a concrete plan by which we are going to bring people to follow Jesus, to do all things that I have commanded you. And that concrete plan is nothing new. It's nothing remarkable. In fact, it's become so familiar that we don't see it. We fail to see it. The concrete plan is simply this, to be the church and to engage in the essential practices of the church that lead us to the fullness of grace and truth that brings us under the authority of God. If we want to be authorized, if we want to be conformed, if we want to live into the fullness of Christ's grace and truth, then we must engage in essential practices that God has established for the church. We must be a church that worships. That's job number one. You can't see Jesus if you don't worship. To be a church at worship is to be a church that is called out of the world. The ecclesia of God. Those who are called out. And they're called out in order to gather for worship. Now I recognize that in these unparalleled days, these unprecedented times, there are challenges to that. And I'm grateful that due to technology, we are, as a church, able to continue to worship as a body, though for a time we have been separated. But even the Apostle Paul recognizes the danger of that, the danger of that separation, the danger of that abstinence of gathering. He says, when you and your spouse abstain from sexual relations, Do that only for a season so that you might pray and devote yourselves to God. But by all means, make sure you come back. Come back together, lest the devil find a way to put a wedge in between you. If we are going to be a church under the authority of Christ Jesus, under the authority of the fullness of his grace and his truth, we must be a church that worships and gathers together. And so the Lord is calling us back. Little by little, but we are coming back. We are called to be a church that engages in the essential and concrete practice of discipleship, learning to live within the God-ordained limits that he has established for us. There is a limit even in the text. There's a limit in the parable. There's a gate. It sets a boundary. And guess what? Right there at the gate is opportunity. Lazarus is at the gate. And the rich man didn't want to live within discipleship, didn't want to live within the God-ordained established limits. He ignored the opportunity at his gate. God is calling us to discipleship, to learn to live within the God-ordained limits and to see the opportunities he is placing at our gate. He has called us to fellowship. If we want to see Jesus, we have to see each other. We are, after all, the body of Christ. Let's not wait until it's too late. Let's be in fellowship with one another. Let's be on mission together as the people of God. If we want to see Jesus, we have to help others to see Jesus. And as we help others see Jesus, our vision and our sight of Jesus becomes all the more clear. We who are called to be the church are called to be those who steward to align our resources in such a way that we see Jesus and don't allow these things to obscure him and not to let it go too long before it's too late. When the church is the church, people come under the authority of Christ. They see it. They're in alignment with it. They experience the fullness of grace and truth. Lazarus. Lazarus means God has helped. That is the meaning of his name. Now, Jesus doesn't say this or give the man the name Lazarus in the story in order to be ironic or even sarcastic. Oh, God has helped as he's dying at the gate. Dogs are licking his wounds. 
Lazarus is a source of help. See, all of us, all of us, we are in the parable to be found in the rich man. All of us, by the standards of history, find ourselves in riches. Even the poorest of us in America are the richest in human history. All of us are to be found in the parable next to the rich man. And we can easily become unaware of our need, unaware of our peril, un need of our spiritual poverty. But God, who is full of grace and truth, sends us Lazarus. And Lazarus is a mirror. He exists at the gate to be a mirror so that every time the rich man walks out the door, he can look at that man and have insight into what it looks like in here. One who is broken. One who is dying. One who is in terrible need. He stands as a witness so that we might see him before it's too late. And have our eyes opened to the need that we have for grace and for truth. Look at him and see what's inside if we are willing to look. But we don't look. We step outside. We step through the gate. We step over Lazarus and we whistle. We go about our business. Hamlet is at a funeral, and he is speaking with Horatio, and Hamlet notices that while they are at the funeral, the grave diggers are digging the grave for the deceased, and as the grave digger is digging the grave for the deceased, digging at this sober and solemn moment, the grave digger begins to sing. And Hamlet is curious. He's arrested by what he hears. And so he asks, has this fellow no feeling of his business that he sings at grave making? Has he no care? Is he not moved? Does he not recognize the moment that he's in? To which Horatio says the following. Custom hath made it in him a property of easiness. I've seen it all before. I've stepped over Lazarus so many times. I don't even notice custom becoming accustomed, growing accustomed to the life that God has given to me, to the measure of grace, to the measure of truth, has made it in me a property of easiness. We grow so accustomed to seeing it, to seeing it out there. We don't want to see it in here. Until it's too late. And then there's nothing that can be done about it. Now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time to see it. Now is the time for decision. Now is the time for action. God has helped. He has given us Lazarus. He's given us not only insight into what our spiritual life looks like. But he's given us a Lazarus who has come back from the dead. A Lazarus who was raised to life in order to reveal to us the fullness of grace and truth. He brings it together and he says, come and follow me. There's a way that leads there. Will you come? Will you be authorized? Will you bow the knee? Will you give yourself to me? Will you love me? Will you follow me 
Will you serve me? Will you allow my power to flow through you? Will you allow my glory to irradiate through your life? Now is the time. Don't wait until it's too late. This is the day of decision. Eternity starts now. Now. Don't wait until conditions are more favorable. Don't wait until there's a vaccine. Don't wait until the economic situation improves. Now is the time. Today is the day of decision. Eternity starts now. Will you follow him? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the Son of God. You are the one who is full of grace and truth. You are the one who has authority. You are the one who has called us to yourself. You've called us so that we might follow you in the way that leads there. You've called us so that we might be conformed to the good purposes and plans that you have for us and for the world. We desire to listen and obey. We desire, Lord, to see before it's too late. Help us, Lord. Help us in our belief. Help us in our trust. Help us, Lord, by pouring out your grace and your truth. Help us, Lord, by coming to us anew, even as you came long ago. Come to us and meet us at the gate of our lives so that we might see. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.